I started my company while I was still in college. My father damaged the nerves in his hand when I was in high school, and with a penchant for mechanics, I created a glove that caused his hand to contract and unclench, resulting in the formation of new nerve pathways. I patented the design and eventually sold it to a medical device company for several million. I had other ideas that eventually came to fruition, and I started my own company to manufacture and sell these devices. Without too much modesty, I have to say that by the time I graduated from college, I was already one of its most successful graduates. I was already one of the most attractive bachelors in college, even as a freshman. Having money and driving a premium Italian sports car didn't hurt my image one bit. I realized that most of my dates were for money, in hopes of marrying well, but that was okay. I dated to get laid. Finding love had never entered my 18-year-old brain. And, as with most things in my life, I was a huge success. Freshman year, I saw Anita for the first time. She was stunning. She was one of those girls who literally, not figuratively, stopped traffic. I realized this when I heard the cars behind me honking and yelling at me to get my head out of my ass and hurry up. I turned as far as I could in the seat of the convertible and overtook them all. Unfortunately, when I turned around, the goddess was gone. I pulled over to the side of the road and rushed around looking for her, but to no avail. For two weeks, I raced every morning to the intersection where I had seen the vision, but to no avail. I was about to give up when one morning I heard a cacophony of car horns and looked up and saw my goddess. I think I tripped over my tongue twice before I caught up with her. I babbled dumbly but managed to convey an invitation for a date. Rarely in my life had I seen a look that so succinctly expressed disgust and nausea. I stopped and stood dumbfounded as she continued. I know that look. You've been lit up. I looked up and saw a red-haired, freckled young man smiling at me. I've seen that look many times. That onion-ass bitch can blow away the toughest guy with just a smirk. Onion-ass? I asked. Yeah, you know, brings tears to your eyes, said my new friend. So I'm going to marry that ass and fry that onion. I'm Justin. Let me buy you lunch and you can tell me all about Miss Blair. I reached out and shook his hand. Anita, he said as we shook hands. Your name is Anita? I was surprised. I would never have guessed it. No, no, he laughed. I'm Brad. No, it was Anita Blair. Over hamburgers, Brad gave me all the details. Anita was a sophomore, a liberal arts student who hadn't yet decided on a major. She's kind of a dilettante as a student. She kind of flows from one interest to another, Brad explained. She's from a small town in Ohio where she was recognized as Miss Spring Flowers 2021. It's a beauty pageant held at their county fair. She seemed very proud of it until one night when she passed out from drinking, the tougher bitches in her sorority hung a sash on her. It read, Miss Spring Flowers from Asshole. Apparently, her behavior pissed off some of the sisters. He chuckled as he told the story. He offered to introduce me to some of Anita's sisters who could arrange for me to meet this goddess in a more friendly manner. I wasn't a wimp at planning. I already knew what could work. The next day after lunch, Brad's friend Rachel let him know when Anita and her would be leaving the sorority and heading to lunch. At just the right moment, Brad and I pulled up in front of my little Italian wonder with the top down. Hi, Rachel, I exclaimed. Can we join you for lunch? Rachel didn't have time to answer before Anita whispered, Please, yes, please join us. The look and smile she gave me was polar opposite to the last look she gave me. As we followed the girls toward the cafeteria, I asked Brad, Did you see the way she looked at me? I think I'm in. I smiled. She didn't even recognize me from yesterday. Brad shook his head. I think that look was directed at the car, but unfortunately, I think you're in on it too. She didn't recognize you because she barely looked at anything but the convertible. Walking ahead of us, I saw her look back a few times, at the car. But this goddess was an amazing woman. She was bright, smart. She spent hours listening to my ideas for inventions. Even my engineer friends never did that. And in bed, she was beyond description. We soon developed an exclusive relationship. And right after I graduated, we were married. Brad, whom I hired to do the bookkeeping for my company and even paid for his continued MBA tuition, was my best man. 
He was a reluctant best man. He persistently advised me to hold off on getting married, get a prenup, or just kill myself right now. Brad wasn't a fan of Anita. I only smiled. I knew something he didn't, something that excited me and filled me with passion for my fiancé. No, not that. Although, yes, that too. No, I was excited about parenthood. My fiancé was pregnant. Josephine was born just six months after we tied the knot and immediately became the apple of my eye. As the years passed, she became more and more like my wife in beauty, grace, and as she moved on to high school, behavior. When she was very young and in elementary school, my little Jojo was a pure delight, daddy's little girl. She had me wrapped around her finger. That was a delight to me. Her mother, who never chose a college major and dropped out as soon as we were married, and who was very protective of me at first, became somewhat demanding and dismissive of me over the years. She still loved my money. My company was becoming more and more successful with each of my new inventions, but seemed to find reasons to remove herself from my immediate environment. I can't sleep well because of your snoring. She would justify her move to the second bedroom in our house. You know I have to eat earlier or I'll just puff up. My model skinny wife would justify when my daughter and I sat down to dinner. My sorority sisters and I will just spend a week at the spa and catch up. I'll come back even more beautiful, was the reason she went on vacation alone several times a year. We still had sex, up to a couple times a week, or so. Come to think of it, we did skip a lot. And apparently she was still in love with me, holding my hand and kissing me when we went out. We went on dates almost every weekend, going to clubs or restaurants she wanted to try. There was always a crowd there. I tried to talk her into going hiking or biking with me, just motorboating on a quiet river or taking a yacht cruise, but I always got a no, or a whole big group of people would get involved in what was supposed to be a private moment. But Jojo was my joy. We went hiking, biking, or just quietly fishing while floating down the river. She was my reflection. Anita rarely interfered with Jojo and I spending time together. She seemed happy for us to spend time alone with each other. Everything changed with the appearance of breasts. Puberty changed my Jojo, changed my relationship with her, and suddenly Anita and Josephine were the couple that had always been together. Don't call me Jojo, Daddy. I'm not a child. This demand came with a look sadly reminiscent of her mother's first look at me. My baby girl was becoming a mom. I watched her grow day by day until finally both mother and daughter were treating me with ever-increasing contempt. It was Jojo's 18th birthday when Brad noticed I looked miserable. My girls were away together on one of their two-week sorority trips, and none of them even bothered to call me during the first week. I objected to them leaving on my daughter's birthday, but I was overruled. Oh, Daddy, we can get together and celebrate when I get back, Jojo said with a chuckle. I felt sorry for myself and told Brad that. My friend shook his head and asked why it bothered me now. Anita never called you while she was gone. You talked about it years ago. Yeah, I never expected her to call, but I miss Jojo. She always called me daily when she was away. Since she started going away with her mother last year, even her calls have gotten less frequent. But a whole week of not calling me? That really hurts. I was ashamed to admit how abandoned I felt. I'm sorry, Justin, but I told you 18 years ago that look was meant for the car, not you. He chuckled as if he was joking and slapped my arm. I glared at him. We both knew it wasn't a joke. Two days later, I got a call, not from Jojo, but from her mother. My daughter had been in a car accident in Quebec, Canada. Strange. I thought they were in Santa Fe. I didn't even know they had left the country. Oh, for crying out loud, Justin. She turned 18 and she wanted a drink, so we changed our plans. Focus. Your daughter is suffering. She has a broken leg and several vertebrae. I want you to send a plane to take us home. I don't want her to have to endure a commercial flight. Since my Lear company was in Europe at this point, I agreed to her demand, but explained that it would be a charter flight from the Quebec airport. I wanted to put Jojo out of possible misery, and besides, a charter would be more expeditious. I called my secretary and she arranged everything. Anita insisted that I didn't need to meet their flight, but I decided to go down anyway. The plane did not land at the time specified by the charter company. When I called the office to find out what the reason for the delay was, I was told that the passengers had requested to land in Lebanon, Ohio, before returning home. 
Why would my girls need to land in Ohio? After thinking about it, I decided that maybe one of the sorority sisters had asked for a ride back. When I asked about the passenger list, I was told that in addition to my wife and daughter, there was a third passenger, one Lars Merton. All my life, people have accused me of being a cloud hoverer, and yes, I am constantly distracted by the thoughts of inventions that are floating around in my head. I know I often don't pay attention to what's going on around me. But I'm not stupid. When the facts finally reach my mind, it doesn't take me long to add up two plus two and realize that five is not an acceptable answer. I held my tongue as the plane landed and my wife and injured daughter got off the plane. On the way home, I learned that my daughter had gotten drunk and walked outside in front of the car. I reacted badly, yelling angrily at Anita. I was shaking with rage. She had taken Jojo out of the country, let her get drunk, and then left her in the street in front of the car. Where the hell were you when she went outside? I was still at the restaurant paying the bill, started Anita, but I exploded. You let her get drunk and then let her go out on the street by herself? Are you out of your mind? She could have been killed. You shouldn't have left her alone. I was furious, and the tension and anger I'd been suppressing within me burst out. Chill out, my daughter shouted back at me. I wasn't alone. My daddy was right. What? What did you say? My voice dropped to a whisper. I saw the panic in my wife and daughter's eyes. The daughter quickly came to her senses. I said I wasn't alone. I said they, the D's, were right there. Mom's sisters. I felt both of their eyes on my face. I shook my head and sat there furious the rest of the way home. Brad set me up with a private investigator and soon the facts were pouring in. Lars and my daughter had somehow obtained a sample that confirmed paternity. A surprisingly small amount of research by the private investigator established that Lars and my wife had dated back in high school and apparently had been friends with benefits ever since, even through college and during my marriage. It was an open secret in their hometown and apparently here too. Lars apparently was her one true love and sissy, whom Anita dated a few times a year. Unfortunately, Lars worked as a manager for a small chain of stores and only made $80,000 a year, and yes, Brad was right when he said Anita's adoring gaze was on my car. Anita preferred richer things than Lars could afford, but by marrying a distracting man like me, she felt she was entitled to both Lars and my money. Quebec City, as it turned out, was the place of choice for my beautiful daughter's sexual education. For her 18th birthday, her mother set her up with several gigolos she happened to know there. The private investigator offered to pay the men to recount the week's events, and they were more than happy to talk. Apparently, her mother told her she could spend years having terrible sex, or she could learn from the experts, and ho, 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 this kid is a damn good student. I've never met a more enthusiastic slut, chimed in one of the quieter quotes. When I had the facts, I confronted Anita and Josephine. My wife only shrugged and pointed out that I just wanted her body. You didn't marry me for my mind, did you? She laughed. You married me because you wanted to fuck me. Well, I did my part. I still let you sleep with me. Can you think of a single time I've turned you down? She smirked. I refrained from answering that there had been many instances where she had avoided me, refusing my offer of even sex. Jojo, as it turned out, had known about her background since her freshman year of high school. Her mother had told her about it, letting her believe that I knew about it and was willing to let a better man make my wife happy. She met Lars when she accompanied her mother to sister hangouts that were really just sex with Lars. Over the next four years, her love for me turned into contempt for the useless cuckold her mother painted me to be. When I denied knowing about Lars, she threw one of her mother's contemptuous looks at me and said, Really, Daddy, no one can be that blind. Even as a child, I knew Mommy was seeing other men. Even you can't be that dumb. Everyone is always telling me how smart you are. You can't be that stupid. When I threatened to divorce Anita and disown Josephine, my girls both laughed. Jojo grinned. Come on, Mom's lawyer said she'll get 60 or 70% of your company in the divorce, and then you'll work for her. I walked away from them, and their laughter followed me. I walked away while visions of invention danced in my head, chasing away their laughter in my growing hatred.
a hatred that would fester for the next six months as I refined the invention I had dreamed up. Anita slowly woke up and saw Josephine stirring on the table next to her. They were having dinner at home, drinking one of the bottles of great wine I had collected. It was her last memory. She saw Jojo dressed in a hospital gown, and as she lowered her eyes, she saw that she was dressed the same way. What happened? She muttered aloud. Oh, good, you're awake. I smirked at her, then walked over and slapped Jojo's face a few times until she opened her eyes. Good, you're awake too. Anita tried to sit up, but found that she, like her daughter, was restrained. Justin, what's going on? What are you doing? It's okay, honey, I reassured her. It's just that I have a new invention that you inspired me to do, and I wanted you to be the first to know about it. Well, you and little Jojo. I picked up my miracle device. It was relatively small and flat, like two plates connected by a short cylinder. Of course, the final version is covered in a soft, foam-like material, and the top side is attached by a wire to a device that generates enough electricity through simple movement to keep the battery charged. Essentially, it could run forever. I smiled at the thought. The top also detects blood and opens ports for its outflow. I'm very proud of it. It was a difficult moment. I was afraid it might detect blood on the other side, where I assumed there would sometimes be blood from violence and such. I smiled again. I don't understand, Anita sobbed. Daddy, what are you talking about, moaned Jojo. My darlings, let me explain. This device is a pregnancy plug, so the services you will be offering will not be interrupted. Services? What the hell are you talking about, Justin? Anita's voice rose. Didn't I say you were my guinea pigs for this device? I installed one in each of you. These are control devices. I smiled. They allow you to perform normal biological functions. Will they work? What have you done to us? Demanded Anita again, panic in her voice. I told you, I installed a control device. Did you know that there are three groups of nerves that send signals from the cervix to the brain? The pelvic, hypogastric, and vagus nerves. And they're very sensitive. It takes very little electricity to excite them. As for excitation, let me show you. I picked up the remotes and touched them both briefly. Instantly, the bodies of both women tried to fly off the tables, and they screamed in pain. See, I said, didn't that work? And it was the gentlest setting. No, please, Justin, you have to stop this, pleaded Anita. Josephine just screamed, help me, someone help me. I shook my head and lightly pressed both remotes. The screams changed in tone and then stopped, replaced by moans and sobs as I released the buttons. Now be quiet, ladies. I need to explain to both of you what's going on. You have both demonstrated what sluts you are and the contempt and disrespect you have for me, so I will send you off to live the life you deserve. But you must realize what kind of devices you are carrying. The batteries are self-charging from another device implanted in your uterus. You have experienced the weakest mode for a very short period of time. Frankly, the highest mode will cause permanent damage, if not death. I would recommend that you follow commands instantly or experience unimaginable pain. Well, it may not be unimaginable to you now, since you have received a small sample. I should also note that the two devices are linked. If one of you dies, the other's device will go off, increasing in intensity with each passing minute until, well, just until. If you are separated too far, both of you will trigger under the same conditions. I've already mentioned that if someone tries to remove one of them, it will immediately shut down at maximum level. And then, when the host dies, the other one's device will trigger. Everyone will die in agony. I shook my head sadly. But you can avoid all that. There's a petty ruler in Africa who has peculiar habits. He likes to sexually abuse his slaves, but what he really wants is one that will obey all his orders and advances. I'm selling him both of you. I have promised him a mother-daughter combination that he can fully control. Please him and all will be well. Refuse him. Well, I won't, just don't. But, 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 let's not forget that there are upsides to being a good slave. A device that can inflict pain can be very pleasurable when sexually stimulated. Sensors detect sexual arousal. This causes a much weaker electrical stimulation of the nerves with selective pulsation that promotes climax contribute to the kind of ecstasies you have only dreamed of.
you will experience sexual sensations that all women dream of, but for you, they will be real, but only if you are a good slave. Your master can also turn on this stimulation whenever he wishes. I gently pressed another button on the remote and held it for ten seconds before releasing it. By the end of it, both my girls had experienced what seemed to be mind-blowing ecstasies. That was the lowest setting, too, for a short time. I'll leave you to imagine the higher settings. Again, the highest setting may kill you, but what a journey it will be. So, Anita, you're going to that light I never knew I had, and Jojo, well, now you're just a ho-ho, but you'll be in friendly company. This ruler has also acquired a new eunuch. I believe his name is Lars. He will be your personal assistant. After the women were sedated, packed and shipped on my airplane to their destination in Africa, Brad joined me in my office. He was listening to my last conversation with the family. Is it true that the devices will go off if they are separated or if they die? I don't remember the devices being connected, commented Brad. No, that was my idea. They will likely be very depressed when they first become slaves, and I wouldn't want one or both of them to take the easy way out but I do believe that these two, as much as they love me, love each other. So I think that caring for each other will make them tolerate slavery longer than they could without it. But while I'm thinking about it, I'm going to tell Prince Babao the same lie. That should keep him from killing, since he will think he will lose both of them if he kills either of them. Maybe he'll be gentler with them. Either way, he'll have an incentive to keep them together. It's an added benefit if they watch each other suffer. I wish them many years of life. Brad shuddered. Remind me never to make you angry. I nodded. That was good advice.